I can't believe how much has changed since I was a little girl. At this point in time, things are still changing. But as I look outside my window at the world, some amazing things have taken place in this place we call life and during my short time within it. During my father's time, there were terrible wars, unimaginable sacrifice, and life was filled with scarcity. So much suffering. In contrast to my father's time, I now live a life of great plenty and have seen amazing changes that no previous generation have ever experienced. Population growth has always been an issue, but it has never been as high as it is now. And as it grows each passing day, it will never be this low again. Thankfully, we have realized that we have a finite resource in this space we call Earth. And also, thankfully, we have finally matured enough to rise to the task of taking care of this fragile place that we call home. My father was a businessman, like many others. I remember him talking about growth as the most important thing driving society and the world's economies. During his time, GDP, or gross domestic product, was the measure of economic health. It seemed to guide everything in his world. I know that at the time they were constantly encouraged to consume, buy new things and discard them, to use resources and materials as if there were no tomorrow. Amazing. It's incredible how much things have changed in such a short time. Now we wouldn't even think about uncontrolled consumption, calling people users and target markets as if they were some kind of subhuman species to be manipulated at will. What a terrible thing to do. Imagine just using and wasting as much as you wanted whenever you wanted to. It is unimaginable now. What were they thinking? Thank goodness they started to realize that this was just not possible, let alone a reasonable thing to do. I am not sure when or how it came about, the shift from a sense of endless plenty to one of personal constraint and responsibility. The idea of enough is so much better, better than always feeling it's never enough. I wouldn't think of behaving that way anymore. Why would I if I care about myself, my friends, my family and the world we live in? In place of an economy based on growth, we now have NEI or Net Ecological Impact. This is a new way of measuring how well our economies are doing as a society compared to other regions and other countries. As a caring society, we all compete for the lowest NEI. This enables governments and businesses to achieve a different form of growth. Growth in happiness and well-being along with ecological rebuilding. This is now seen as just as important. Growth in profit is not so important anymore. It took us a while to get here, but we finally realized that the idea of happiness is fundamentally important to us. And if it was undermined by the old profit-driven economy, then it was a deeply flawed model. Organizations like the WTO, OECD and World Bank are almost defunct now. The Alliance for Ecological Management, AEM, has detached our income systems from a monetary base, which effectively no longer exists. We are no longer concerned about striving to earn as much as possible. We can now focus on our happiness we know we have enough to live on. That old growth system was essentially doomed to fail. Money, as we used to call it, never did buy happiness. In fact, it actually created a great deal of misery. We realized that reconnecting with how we care for ourselves and others, how we contribute to our communities of work and play, these were the only ways to achieve personal growth and happiness. Thank goodness we were able to rewrite the foundations of economics, education and policy. And even how people acted in their lives. 
we began to really understand how to care. We are just one species of animals in a fragile ecology. We realized that economic structures that promoted greed in all its forms was a flawed idea. We began to embrace a smarter way of living. We began to manage our resources more sensibly, natural as well as human resources. We did it in ways that helped us to live better and that did not harm us, either in the way we obtained them or used them. This realization was a little late in coming. Thank goodness some of my father's generation finally realized that they had got it all wrong by prioritizing artificial systems of greed and growth in industry and finance they were harming the very people who were supposed to benefit from them what an astoundingly stupid thing to do they had in effect been developing and improving mechanisms for bringing about our own demise thank goodness we worked out how to change that in time of course the old order the patriarchal monopolies are still trying to hang on to their profits at all costs. But public opinion has shifted dramatically in the last many years. We no longer want to go back to the days of economic dependency and outrageous inequality. We have found a middle way. We balance our personal needs with those of the economic system that supports us all. The widespread implementation care economics and codes of caring practice in business have been a big help. We only buy what we need rather than constantly being urged to consume as much as we want. This has helped us feel more relaxed. We now feel happy to have enough. We feel better knowing that we are all helping to manage what we have and what we know are very finite resources. We no longer talk about waste and waste management. What a silly idea. Why would we want to waste anything? We now talk about resource maximization, resource recovery and minimal resource utilization. The very idea of wasting precious materials is appalling. We see the byproducts of our lives as valuable resources within a finite and fragile ecosystem. Why would we want to waste any of that? The use of virgin material is almost unthinkable and severely frowned upon by most of society. Before we make anything new now, we always ask, what can it do that will make the world a better place? Do we really need it? Can we use something we already have? Can we do it in a way that doesn't use up more precious resources? Is the use of scarce virgin materials justified? And if we do use these materials, how will they be recovered afterwards? We use our coal and fossil-based materials for pharmaceuticals and other essential items. We do not burn them for energy with the deadly side effects those processes caused. We know that there can be no more open cycle use of materials and resources. We now know and understand that we are part of a larger, wonderful ecology bound by a nurturing stratosphere. Why would we endanger that? It doesn't make sense. I work in a care corporation. I spend time on the road, helping set up and maintain programs that nurture communities of care within my company. Most companies have these now, in health, education, industry, and even in defense. A big shift has been enabled by simply abandoning the false belief that artificial efficiency systems matter. Utilizing the net ecological impact legislation and applying various care corporation certification processes, we have balanced the business ecosystem, of which we are a big part. We are able to work slower. We need to produce less. We do more ourselves rather than allowing machines to do everything. We make and supply for local people and not global markets. We realize that faster, bigger and more efficient is not our way. In the past, we mistakenly put too much of our trust in the economic and social manipulations of an elite 
and careless few. We have effectively repossessed what it means to be human. In the process, we have reconnected to a magical aspect of what makes us human. We like to care and to care about others. And while we like to have nice things, we know they cannot make us truly happy. Only other people can. Historians and social anthropologists are having a field day, looking back and telling us how it all came about, how we got caught up in different forms of scientific progress. Why did we readily and greedily embrace capitalism and its focus on personal greed? It turned us all into mindless consumers. Like addicts, we became hungry for anything new as we raced towards the brink of annihilation. Thank goodness we snapped out of it in time. How fortunate that we had the emotional and conscience intelligence to avert that disaster. It's too late to fully repair the damage we have done. But now we have to be very careful with what is left. We have to rebuild our ravaged ecology and begin to rectify some of the outrageous things that were done in the past. Conservism has almost replaced the failed institutions of capitalism. We are able to enjoy lives that we alone are responsible for creating. Only I am responsible for creating my own system of work and reward as I build a satisfying life for myself. The basis is earning enough rather than having to constantly strive for more. Monetary wealth was always a tantalizing goal, but forever out of reach. And we realize it does not lead to happiness. Now we earn credits according to how and what we contribute to the communities of work and home. This has released my generation from a terrible cycle of consumerist addictions and depressive work-life imbalances. What a horrible treadmill that was. I am not entirely sure when the real change happened. It seems like such a long time ago now, but in real terms, it was only yesterday. About the time when that book, Why Care, appeared. I remember thinking, what a simple idea. But somehow, it seems to have triggered something in many people. It talked about why care was important, why care was not what we all had thought it was, it had become a bit like the words love, hate and like. They didn't mean anything anymore. That book, Why Care, seemed to answer its own question by explaining how every one of us is important and that we are deeply responsible for everything that we do. All of a sudden, I could see that there was something that I could do to make things better. By taking personal responsibility for all of my actions, my life could become meaningful through my own behavior. I could add something positive to the total sum of all things. This was not groundbreaking stuff, but when my eyes were open to it, it became obvious. For once, there was something real and tangible that I could do to make things better. It was not up to others to fix everything, I could actually make a difference. I think that in my father's time, one of the biggest problems was a kind of collective apathy or a naive optimism. Something or someone would come along and save the planet, as they used to say. I think they were afraid to face the truth. For generations, they had been lulled into thinking by politicians, businesses, organizations, religious leaders. They had been lulled into thinking that people knew what they were doing and would somehow provide a solution. Of course, everyone really wanted things to stay the same. Nobody wanted to change. They knew deep down that they had to, but nobody wanted to be the first. Thank goodness, they finally realized that there were no leaders to save them. People in positions of power were ordinary people just like them, and they weren't taking personal responsibility any more than other people were. Somehow and slowly, they eventually accepted 
that there were no silver bullet solutions. The answers they were looking for could only come about if each and every person took responsibility. That was a major turning point. The popular activist movements of the early 2020s were very important. They were fueled by growing pockets of aggressive resistance and outpourings of anger from increasing numbers of disenfranchised people. The second great economic collapse in the early decades of this century triggered a new will to change. All the unemployed, all the people looking for a way to survive in an economy that was not built to nurture them, all these people saw the answer was right there in front of them. Only they could provide the solutions they needed, not the institutions, not the business and government that had been used to deliver vast profits into the hands of a select few. Thankfully, in our new economy, the insatiable elite have been sidelined. They are spurned by a society that values and acknowledges caring, sharing and community support. Our new economic organisations are built on community. People can flourish by doing fulfilling work and through their contribution to all aspects of a healthy society. I think it was in the mid-twenties that care became a rallying cry for those who felt they didn't have a voice or didn't matter. When and how that came about, I don't really know. It was just an idea. It was what people needed. They needed not to be cared for or cared about in ways that made them dependent on an external system. They needed to care for themselves and their loved ones in ways that gave them pride in being alive and mattering in the greater scheme of things. The idea helped them to feel important for the first time in a long time. They embraced it and ran with it. It seems amazing now that we were able to reconfigure our economic system so quickly. Now we can't see or understand why we did it in any other way. Once we decided to change, the change just seemed logical and it was embraced. I don't remember a slow and gradual or even difficult period of transition. All of a sudden it was there and made perfect sense. Why not care? The very idea of care makes a nonsense of the wars fought over religions and ideologies of any kind. As human beings, we are all alike. It makes a joke of killing people over resources. If we realize that we are all an integral part of a greater ecology. Nobody wins in the long term if we ruin our ecological support systems while fighting over them. Our miraculous ecology will go on without us. And if our overly inflated importance as a species causes our own demise, what does the ecology care? Not at all. Of course, we will always have people fighting over something, but people can care deeply about something other than money, land and power. When you take away the power of those things, they stop mattering so much in people's lives and you change the balance of power. And deep down, what really matters to people are other people. The artificial monetary system based on growth, that was the real trigger for change moving from a system of greed to one that reinforces personal and community growth led us to be able to do fulfilling work. We are enriched through personal achievement. We embrace our future because it is linked to others. When we actually began to prioritize human standing and value in the new financial system, it was forever changed for the better. We developed the tools for change improvement that was not based on unsustainable growth, a new way to look at the real human issues of health and well-being, quality of life, inequality in all its forms and unchecked ecological destruction. Before this change, 
We were out of control. Thank goodness that is no longer the case. What a difference it has made to so many lives to feel that there is hope. That there is a positive job for each and every one of us to do that gives us meaning. That we matter and that we can look our children in the eyes and know that we have not substantially depleted the world by our being here. We can say to them with pride that we did our bit to make it better and not worse. We can say with pride that we cared.